Chris has worked with the private sector in, uh, in Afghanistan through uh, AID contractors. He's worked, and now he is working with the USAID, so he's on the, the other side of the, the contract. So he's, he's seen development assistance in Afghanistan from a variety of perspectives. I know he's going to present a very engaging uh, uh, discussion with you all, and he really likes participation. He, uh, he really uh, he does quite well when you, you ask him good, uh, provocative questions, I would say. And as a qualified on my face. Yeah, and so um, I have told Chris to um, <clears throat> that, that a, a number of you are interested in how value chains really work, and Chris did work on a, uh, a value chain project for, for some years in the South. Now he's working with the AID, so if you, please, if you've got any questions on value chain, Chris is the man to talk about that while you're in the, in, in the session here. And then um, I know a number of you have talked about the, are there good sub substitutes for opium? And Chris has experience with that as well. So we'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, good morning. Um, as Paul was saying, my name is Chris Payne. I work for USAID now. I used to work for implementers in Afghanistan. Um, I spent a couple of years living in Kabul. I also spent a couple of years living down south, uh, Helmand and Kandahar, primarily in Kandahar. So I know a bit more about uh, that place. The presentation today about development in Afghanistan, which is a difficult subject. Doing development any place is a, is, a, is a difficult thing to do. Doing it in a war zone, even more so. The subtitle of the presentation here, Making Fewer Mistakes. You know, we can all be, uh, we don't want to be the donkey up in the air, which is an actual picture, right? It's easy to do, right? Um, and I'm wondering this, you guys have had now a, a week of classes, right? You're all Afghan ag experts. Some of you have been there before. Did you put a, an asterisk next to something in your notebook? Did you highlight something, put an arrow? Anything really stick out in your mind in terms of what you ought to be doing, what you ought to not be doing? I heard yes over here. What? Like one of them, of course, is Afghan buy-in, like trying to work through that deal, making sure that the Afghans are set up front because as you're moving into transition, doing long-term, or I shouldn't say long-term, but these huge you know, projects that are costing you know, thousands upon thousands of dollars uh, millions, yes, millions, yes, or it's hundreds of millions, yes, yes yeah. Uh -huh. USAID, right, right. Well, Unless you're DOD, and then which it starts with a B, I think. But yes, you're right. Yeah, good. That's so. That's slide twelve. Anybody else? <laughs> Nobody. Nothing else sticks out. The, the value chain, just understanding that there's a uh, huge ripple effects across uh, in how you touch and stuff. Um, right. Excellent. Good. Slide fourteen. Got that one checked off. We can skip that one. Anything else? <laughs> Watershed, watershed, um, watershed management. Ah, water, good. I oh, love that. Yeah, huh? good. That's three more slides right there. We cross those off. Anything else? All right. So the first couple of slides are about your different environment. So uh, it, now in the back we have Josh. I don't know if you guys have met Josh. He's from Kansas. I'm from Kansas. You guys have spent a week out in the field. Did you see all the, the corn and wheat fields? Yes. Paul, no, no corn and wheat fields? That's no, sweet corn. <coughs> sweet corn. Yeah, but Right, right. Well, why, you know, around Fresno, why not a lot of wheat and corn? Any ideas? Paul, why not a lot of wheat and corn? And it's not worth it. And it's not worth it, okay. Yeah, they can grow higher value crops just like in certain parts of Afghanistan. Right. I have three examples. This is from the eastern part of the country, Paktia, right? Where we have uh, mountains. We've got your, your, your safer car wash that's in the middle. Um, we have mountainous province. These are straight off the website, the UC Davis website, which I think you guys got earlier in the week, right? Um, not, not in order of, uh, of importance. Wheat, maize, rice, potatoes. Think stay alive. Think food to eat. Think not a lot of money. Um, livestock, we'll get to that later. First one, force. Well, you can maybe smuggle that into Pakistan or something like that. There's not a lot of huge money making in a place like mountainous eastern Afghanistan. Nangahar, land of milk and honey, right? So we got happy farmers, we've got nice warm weather. The first thing it says on the list is good irrigation, high value fruits, vegetables. On down the list, right? This is a very diverse country. And depending on where you are, being a farmer is a tremendously different thing. And Paul mentioned counter narcotics earlier. 90% of of poppy in Afghanistan is grown in two, three provinces. 
about almost half of the world's supply comes from just Helmand. It's a very different place. Exporting grapes, melons, so this is a very different environment than, say, Paktia or Paktika. Oh, here we go, Helmand. Now, I don't know why they're passing around our water in poppy fields, but the flowers are very pretty, right? Huge river, good irrigation, and actually the U.S. in the 50s and 60s was responsible for much of the irrigation system built in Helmand. <coughs> Melons, pomegranates, grapes, raisins, this is all money in your pocket. I should have said in the previous one, always sweet. That's just a notification that in Afghanistan, practically every farmer will grow some amount of wheat because you can always eat it. You don't know what's going to happen to your crop, right? It might be a bad year in terms of your vegetable crop or your fruit crop might fail, right? In which case you're really with somewhere without a paddle, right? So, very diverse environment. Oh, and what else we have? We have coochies. Helmand is just one example where you've got a noticeable uh, uh, coochie population. So, you've had a whole week of class, right? Low-hanging fruit. Uh, a lot of things that can be done. We mentioned some of them, right? Irrigation, you guys asked about, um, uh, asked about different value chains. What do you think about this list here, those bullet points? Any aha moments? Anybody who's been there before seen this at all? Any, exper any experiences like this? Who's been there before? Did you see any of this there? Experience? I don't know what your job was. So I don't know any, what, what any of your job is going to be. I'm sorry? I didn't see too much of it where I was. Okay. Where in, where in Afghanistan were you? Uh, I was in uh, on the Gulf. Okay. That's a, that's a lovely place. There's yeah. pomegranates, you know, world's best pomegranates right there. That's, that too, right, right. I'm not a big fan myself. Uh, So building a dependency, something like that, right? Yeah. What about that first one, displacing the private sector? Even if you haven't seen it, could you make up a story about how we might displace the private sector? Microloans. Microloans? Yeah, if we're handing them out, I guess, directly, right? Um, there was, I think, some years ago, uh, I think, especially on the DOD side, quite fond of doing vet caps, right? Let's go in and vaccinate all the animals, right? It's a great idea. The farmers are happy, right? But sometimes what happened is that, you know, the guy who's a paraveterinary maybe in the community, right? You're not buying medications, vaccinations from that guy, right? So for the next six months, he's potentially out of a job, right? Because you've taken his job from him. On the, on the civilian side, you know, at different times and for different reasons sometimes we do a lot of distributions of seed and fertilizer and there's maybe a very good reason why but it also displaces the private sector right undertaking traditional community responsibilities so a, a favorite one in that category this is both on military side the civilian side US government other governments we're like well, well let's do cash for work programs right let's uh, pay them to clean out drains and canals because irrigation is absolutely critical right which is correct, absolutely. Irrigation is critical. And for the last thousand years, they've been doing it on their own. Why are we suddenly paying it for it, right? All right, Goldilocks. So a lot of things to be fixed. Um, and there's a lot of things that could be done, that we have done. But of course, we want to get the biggest bang for our buck. So I have a few examples here of, you know, where, where in the kind of chain from simple to complex you might want to be working? Or in your case, because you know, you're the transition group, right? Another year, we're all going to be packing up our bags and going home. They've already started, right? And we'll get to that a little bit later. Irrigation, there's a reason I put it first, right? Incredibly important in Afghanistan. That first one, flood irrigated on unleveled ground. That's the norm in Afghanistan. That is what they do. What about that last one on the list, drip irrigation? You guys saw drip irrigation, right? Yeah. Paul, honey, yeah? Yeah, they saw it out there in the farm yesterday. Will that work in Afghanistan? 
Because? They'll steal all the pieces. I'm sorry? They'll steal all the pieces. They'll steal the pieces? Oh, uh, yeah, that's definitely one reason. Yeah, absolutely. Parts. Oh, parts. parts. Yeah, absolutely. Cost. Cost. Fabulous. Electricity, pumps, high water pressure, clean water, all of that. Not so much. Somewhere in here, though, um, is the right thing that you can do doing the irrigation at uh, the proper times, the right, proper amount. Rows and furrows. So a little story from Helmand. We, uh, we were trying to convince farmers that they should plant their corn in a row. And they said, no, no, that's not how you plant corn. You know, you grab it, you toss it, right? That's how my daddy did it, and that's how my granddaddy did it, and that's how I'm going to plant my corn. We are like, no, nah, plant it in a row. He goes, I'm not going to do that. That's high risk. Where did you come from, 10,000 miles away? What could you possibly know? So we said, okay, fine. We're, we'll rent half your field i.e. all your risk is, is gone. The farmer says, that's fine by me. And we said, we'll use your seed. We'll use the same amount of water. Uh, we'll use exactly the same fertilizer all down on the row. And X number of months later, his corn was here and our corn was there. And they're standing right next to each other. And he's like, you, you guys use some juju powder at night. And we're like, no, you know we didn't, right? Of course, much more efficient. You don't have plants competing for each other. The water's used much more efficiently. It has a huge impact. So something really simple, incredibly low cost, can have a huge impact. Sprinklers, a bit of a drip irrigation problem as well. Um, it doesn't matter that you have to say no to drip irrigation all the time in every place. There are, I'm sure, examples somewhere in Afghanistan where it's working, right? But these are just kind of, let's say, if you're involved with a project, you're asked to fund a project, you're being asked to say, choose A or choose B, which should we fund? Try to do the simple thing first. If the simple thing works, then move up a step. That's basically all I'm trying to communicate. If you can get something that'll have a 20% return, I don't know, my bank account is not growing by 20%, I don't know about yours, but that's a pretty good return. If you can grow 20% per year, that'd be fabulous, right? Try that first. Try to do the doubling later on. Cold chains. For those of you who haven't been in Afghanistan before, you probably have a lot of politicians, maybe even farmers. They love yakking about cold chains, how wonderful and fabulous they are. And they are. The critical word there is chain. Cold chains work best when they go from A to Z. The farmer harvests, the product goes into a cold chain. It doesn't leave that cold chain until the final consumer purchases it. If somewhere along that chain you have a break in the cold chain, is chances are you've done more harm than good for that product. In a place with limited electricity, that can be tough to come by. That doesn't work. That's why most of Afghanistan cold chains are non-existent. Um, you can harvest during the cool part of the day. Say you're growing grapes, that would be a good thing to do. You can use cooling tubs, fancy word for big bucket of cold water. Cool rooms, different than cold. Cool room, big hole in the ground. If you're living in Bamyan, central part of the country, where they grow lots and lots of potatoes, dig a hole in the ground, keep it cool. They've been doing that for a thousand years. Works very well. Big impact on what happens to potatoes and all kinds of other crops. The last one, cold storage at every step of the chain, and yeah, not so much in Afghanistan. Expensive. Um, how often does leapfrogging work? Mm, not so much. Uh, try doing it one step at a time. I have a couple more examples. Soil fertility is a huge issue in Afghanistan because Afghan farmers, by and large, don't do a lot about it. They don't use manure on the fields because, well, with manure, you can build with it, you can burn it, you can do a 10 other things. It's a good thing to put. Everybody loves you know, nice organic matter in soil very happy, it's a very good thing, but it can also take some years to really get the full benefit. Leaving some organic matter on the, f on the field, excellent idea, but why would you do that? Because the goats might eat it, right? So it's a bit more short-term in nature what they're doing. In the long run, not so good. They do use fertilizer if they can afford it, but there's cheap fertilizer and there's good expensive fertilizer, and the way they do the math, they think the cheap fertilizer is the better way to go. In a lot of instances, they're wrong, but trying to convince them to change their behavior when, you know, you've just come from Mars. 
is a bit difficult. Dale capacity building. Anybody here who's dealt with Dales? In the back, what was your experience? Where were you? Right. They are very variable. And sometimes you will get people at Dales, extension officers, who are fully trained, really motivated, engaged with their farmers, have the resources to go visit farmers and provide extension services. Sometimes a Dale extension agent is, you know, somebody's cousin who couldn't hack it as a farmer, who drink, sits in the building all day drinking tea because... He does have a motorcycle to go places, but he doesn't have gas to put in the motorcycle. He's illiterate, and he's a very nice guy, but he can't help out the farmers in his community a lot. You'll figure out very quickly who you're dealing with. Trying to expect somebody who is untrained and uh, uh, cannot provide a lot of services to automatically jump to a higher level, of course, almost impossible. And you figure out very quickly who you're dealing with. Realize that... In the long run, working with the Afghan government is the ultimate solution, but it is more frustrating, more time consuming, and all of these wonderful things, um, but it is a sustainable path. One more. We could go through these examples for all these other categories, just realize that, and you may bump into some of those subject matters, whether it's orchards, whether it's sweet, you name it, and you've had a whole week on this. That picture down there. I don't know if you can tell what it is, but so this is in uh, Kandahar, and Kandahar, like several other places in the country, grow a lot of raisins. And what's the normal way to dry raisins in Afghanistan? Sun dry? Sun dry where? Oh, sun dry on the ground. And then, of course, you use your shovel, your rake, your what, your feet, and you put them all in a big pile? Right. So. When you package raisins in Afghanistan, certainly there's some uh, sticks, uh, some dirt, some uh, manure, some rocks, and some raisins in the bag. We looked at that and we're like, you know, you could do something about that. And they're like, well, but this is how we do it. And, um, you know, this is really cheap and we really can't afford anything else. And oftentimes, you know, when you want to do development, you want to have the person you're trying to help, the beneficiary, puts skin in the game. We violated one of our own rules, if you will. We bought reed mats. That's what those things are. I don't know, buck fifty a piece. We bought like 10,000 of them. And we say, look, dry your raisins on these. You know, you can still put them, put them on the ground, but it'll help them, you know, stay clean a lot more. The farmer, of course, is like, well, that's pretty low risk. Farmers don't like to change their behavior so much, but they're like, oh, that's, there's no risk in that, right? Um, huh? You came back a few months later and you were using them uh, No, no, they kept using them because what happened is they sold these raisins at the end of the season for double the price. I don't know if anybody else, anybody want to increase their salary by 100%? That's what these guys did, right? Overnight, they doubled the price of their raisins because they took them to the traders, and the traders were like, hey, this is all raisins, <laughs> almost no rocks. We said, yes, it's a new era. <laughs> so, um, you know, reed mats, of course, degrade over time. Last I heard, four or five years after we brought these things in, they were still using these reed mats, the identical ones, which is amazing. Um, because they do degrade over time. And there are other solutions about, you know, this is very low cost. One of my uh, friends, he started to do the <coughs> same idea. He ended up using gravel and shade netting, where you put down gravel, clean it off with water, put shade netting on top of it, put the raisins on that. Then when you've dried your raisins X number of weeks later, all you do, take up the shade netting, which is plastic, and you can keep reusing it year after year after year to clean it, all you have to do is hose it down, right? So an incredibly simple innovation, change of behavior, very low risk, and they doubled the price of their raisins. Keep that in mind. Killer apps. So some of my favorite examples, I like the first one because it is only three friggin' letters. So, yes, 
What's the normal way to transport fruit and vegetables in Afghanistan? For those of you who have been there, or any other similar place, I heard somebody say pile. I don't know where that was. Yes. Toss in truck, shovel in truck, toss in bag, throw on roof. Travel down bumpy road, end up with some mush and some product. I was in Kandahar. We were getting a lot of Argandab pomegranates. And we said, look, these are very valuable fruit. You need to protect them. And they said, yeah, but you know, boxes are expensive. And where are we going to get them from? At the time, there were no box factories in all of Kandahar. So flash forward, there are now two box factories in Kandahar, by the way. Um, we said, put your fruit in this. You'll be able to transport them all the way to India. When they get to India, you still have pomegranates. The whole truckload will still be pomegranates. And you'll get a good price. And we will actually subsidize some of your risk because you're not sure about buying expensive boxes. I mean, you know, that might cost you 25, 50 cents a pop, which when you get 10,000 boxes actually starts to add up. They put their pomegranates in boxes. Lo and behold, they got them to India, and they made a ton of money. There are now two box factors in India, in, in Kandahar. Really simple. Three letters. Manure, I think I covered that one. Trader introductions, then get out of the way. The reason that second part there, then get out of the way. Sometimes one of the favorite phrases you'll hear uh, from a farmer, if you say, why aren't you doing X, or why aren't you doing Y, they go, I don't have access to markets. It's a favorite phrase in the development industry as well. Access to markets, right? Which is a way of saying, well, where am I going to sell it? What do I have? How can I get it? How can I possibly compete? We ended up doing introductions. We brought traders from Kandahar in that sense. What sometimes happens in a lot of different contexts is that the person who's done that, whether it's a civilian or military, they want to like, be part of it. You know, like They started and they want to be part of it. Get out of the way. They don't need some American, some put in you know, nationality standing between a trader and farmer. They have a 1,000 years of experience doing this. They don't need you negotiating. All you do is alter the price in, a, in the wrong way. Pruning, very expensive, isn't it? Yes. Fabulously well done. Uh, honey, did you give a lecture on pruning? Who, somebody did. Paul did. I'm sorry, Paul did. Paul. Paul left the room. Yes. So, incredibly expensive. No, of course not, right? Trying to convince a farmer now, please cut away a third of your tree. The farmer's looking at you like, are you insane? That's, that branch is growing fruit, right? Which is true. But of course, they'll get more. This is one of those high risk activities, right? Low cost, but from the farmer's viewpoint, high risk. Because the farmer's thinking, are you nuts? This is how I make my income from this tree. Why would I cut it away? Of course, in the long run, it's got a big benefit. It's one of those examples of a development activity that you have to introduce slowly. And one of the things that we'll cover later is the different timelines. You know, I was there a really long time, four years. Ha, 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 right? A lot of you guys, maybe one year, right? Development, 10 years, 20 years, right? Things like that. The timelines are totally, totally different. Uh, but it's still a very good thing. Road planting, I think we covered. Irrigation infrastructure, there's a little question mark there. We don't need to pay them to clean out the ditches and drains on their farm. Maybe if there's really big irrigation infrastructure where you need engineers and equipment and all of that, it's appropriate for the donor community, whether military, civilian, to be involved. Certified seed, big fan of certified seed, really good seed. In Afghanistan, they've got really old seed, basically stuff they've been using for 10, 20, 30 years, right, in terms of its breeding, which means the yield is awfully low. Certified seed, it's, been set, it's basically been a breeding process in place, right? It's a very good idea, and I think donor community has now supported three or 400 certified seed producers in Afghanistan. It's more expensive, well worth it. Maybe there's a role to help do initial subsidy for a farmer. That's why there's the question mark. In terms of a killer app, in terms of things that I've encountered personally, the government is not listed there. I'll give you the message again. In terms of the long run sustainability, working with the Afghan government uh, is the right way to go. From a day to day basis, it can be frustrating, annoying, and all of those things. A little story that, you know, 
apophrical perhaps, right, is that, uh, you know, military unit comes into a village and they see a schoolhouse and missing a roof. Yeah, commander looks at it. What are we going to do about that? And somebody walks up. Sir, we can have that fixed in 48 hours. Of course, that's not what you want to do. It's the wrong answer because, of course, there's a reason there's no roof on the schoolhouse, right? Why didn't they fix it themselves? Where was the community? Why didn't the shura take responsibility? What was the provincial governor on, uh, about? You know, Where are the mechanisms for them to do that themselves? Because yes, you can fix the schoolhouse roof in 48 hours, but you haven't changed any of the mechanisms that'll keep it that way in perpetuity. So, you know, go visit the district governor who may be, you know, it'll take weeks and months and you want to pull your hair out perhaps, but that is the way to go. Any questions yet? Because I do death by PowerPoint really well. It's certified seed. Um, I thought something came out from maybe it was mail or maybe it was ISAF saying that uh, seed distribution isn't supposed to be done by coalition forces anymore. Um, right. Did that happen or is that? Wait, uh, so over the past 10 years, there have been different phases where both military and civilian have done seed distributions for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is complete, say, harvest failure. You know, weather was atrocious. They're going to starve the following season. There's an emergency humanitarian distribution of seed. Uh, one is you think it's a stabilization activity. You think if we can get them to grow a lot of wheat, especially in the south, for example, wheat is pretty much the only crop that in terms of the calendar competes with poppy. So if you give away the inputs on the wheat side, Right, they may be induced to grow wheat, even though they know they're, in terms of dollar terms, they'll be getting less back, right? Certified seed is just a much higher yielding seed, and it is a good thing, which is why there are certified seed producers now, and farmers are starting to realize that if they spend a bit more up front, they more than make it up on the, on the back end. Um, I don't think there's really very much reason at all for either military or civilian to be doing seed distributions at this point. Doesn't the government do it? I mean, I'm sure it doesn't <coughs> Right, so it, uh, there are uh, um, food, in, there are perennially food insecure provinces in Afghanistan, mostly in Central Highlands, for example, in the Northwest and things like that. And so you can foresee for several years now to go into the future, you'll still be doing some kind of seed or, or wheat flour distribution. Um, but by and large, that shouldn't, you know, in the long run, you don't want that to be necessary, of course. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned about irrigation, cleaning out canals, and then mm. not paying the of the city. But my thought is, you know, look at you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago in the U.S., most people, you know, mow the grass. You can see a lot of, I think it's, it could be something where they, you could actually, a, a business can be built on that because you can't any return to go, well, I'm going to create a company that mm -hmm. does this. I might be a little too far ahead for them, I don't know, but to go out and that's what they do. Right. Years ago, you know, like you see a lot of guys uh, uh, having mowing services uh -huh. in the neighborhoods because usually kids do it. Now, nowadays, you see that type of business, and it grew out of where they were a commercial mowing grass, right, right. and then they moved into the neighborhood. So, I mean, it's a, it's not a bad thing, but I mean, I, I guess you got to find someone that's going to be entrepreneurial who's going to turn around right, and right. say, "Hey, I'll go out and start doing this." As a, Right, but you know, depending on where it is, if it's on a farmer's field or if it's, let's say, a public resource because it you know, comes from the river or the canal or something like that and feeds an entire neighborhood, if you will, there's no reason that the donor community needs to do this, right? Because there are mechanisms, traditional mechanisms within these communities to do all of that because they do realize the value. For some reason, that broke down. One of the reasons that broke down is 30 years of conflict, right? Um, and so Afghans will need to reestablish those mechanisms themselves to make, take care of this resource, whether it's by the government paying somebody to do it, somebody thinks it's a good entrepreneurial idea, farmers taking extra responsibility on their own farms, depending on you know, where this drain and canal is and things like that. But us paying for it, that doesn't make sense because we're all going away, right? Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think we should just constantly pay for it. But I think someone... Someone needs to be able to show someone, hey, you can actually make money doing mm. this. That's what I'm getting at. Right. So, and how that works, I don't know. I mean, right. 
How do you create that business? Yeah, yeah. What is easy? How is hard? So what? That's easy, right? You're all experts now. You've had uh, an entire week of it. You know that Afghan agriculture, by the way, it is the most important subject matter in Afghanistan, agriculture. And maybe I forgot to say that at the beginning. Now, I understand that you know, not getting shot at or not getting blown up always takes precedence. If you're out of that situation, this is what Afghans want to talk about. They want to talk about agriculture. It is roughly 80% of the population is engaged in agriculture in one way or the other. This is the important topic in the country. You want to relate to somebody, you want to make friends with somebody, you want to get information from somebody, talk about agriculture. It comes above everything else. I know we love health and education and all those other wonderful, wonderful things that you may do in a community. This is number one. Are the problems known? Of course, you've had a whole week of classes, you know at least 50 things that could be fixed. By the way, these guys with the swivel turrets and the guns, these are your friendly neighborhood extension agents. Hi, we're here to help. This is intimidating for me. Imagine being an Afghan farmer. This is intimidating. Um, so how's your corn doing? Don't mind the swivel gun over my shoulder. This makes it tough, right? This makes it tough, especially in your position. I may only show up in a Corolla or an armored car or something like this. This is extra intimidating. MRAP development, I put it, huh? Um, how you go about your work is incredibly important. How you actually do it. The what is easy in a sense, right? We know that irrigation is bad. We know that their fertilizer is bad. On down the list. We know that they should be pruning. Blah, 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 right? How you go about it is, is the big thing. In your MRAP, maybe you go places that other people don't. You know, civilians don't like being shot at, and probably you guys don't either, but, you know, maybe a bit more protection, right? Your time horizon also, right? I think we covered this, you know, mentioned it earlier. Really short, right? Especially from an Afghan's perspective, if you're an Afghan farmer, right? Especially now that we're in transition, right? At the very bottom of there, it says predecessors and successors. So you've certainly had predecessors. And you do have successors in a way, right? They may take a different, a different form, a different shape, and things like that whether it's civilian entities, whether it is Afghan government entities, there are successes to the work that you may be asked to engage on, whether you're doing a project yourself, whether you're finding out what somebody else is doing and, and you're trying to coordinate your activities, you do have successors. Figure out what those are. Figure out what your predecessors are doing right now. If you can reach out, if you know where you're going, do that because that may help you out quite a bit. Questions? So, we have this slide and then we have a five minute break. So, actual quote from an actual class. You might have NGOs running around your battle space. Sound reasonable enough, right? And I don't know how timely the word battle space is, right? AOR, same idea, right? I understand that if you're in the military, you're given a map, somebody draws a box on it and says, this is the area that you're responsible for, in, right? How much does that relate to, say, the farmer or the government representative that you may be engaging with? Because if you're an Afghan farmer, you say, well, you may have your box, but my irrigation water comes from that direction. The road where I sell my product to goes in that direction. The tribe that I really can't deal with and hence have to go to that secondary market is in that direction. That's their mind space, right? That's their battle space in agriculture, right? These aren't going to overlap. You may have your area of responsibility. Just realize that most of the people that you're engaging with don't have that same set of lines on their map. If you can put yourself in their shoes as it were, figuring out what are their concerns, it's going to make your job a lot easier. Okay, five minutes, and then we polish up. I don't want to kill you, really, with the PowerPoint, so. Questions, any comments yet? Anything you've violently objected to? Because you can say that as well. Nothing? <laughs> sorry, what, what? Objections? You have no bees in your presentation. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, yeah. Uh, or heroin likes apples. Uh. <laughs>
We can talk about heroin later on if you want to. Brian does all that. Yes, he does. Only in apple form. <laughs> Are farmers con conservative? This is not a political question. The title is food security, right? Risk averse. Right. Risk averse, yes, thank you very much. Absolutely. Farmers are risk averse worldwide. They don't want to change their behavior. Their income depends on exactly what they do, right? You change some behavior on the land, who knows what's going to happen to that harvest. Are Afghan farmers even more conservative? Well, for those of you who haven't been there, let me just tell you that the answer is yes, they are. They do not want to change the behavior because, well, they've had chronic inf inf food insecurity in several parts in the country for the last 30 years. This is high up on their agenda. Our Afghan farmers, whose very survival depends on one wheat, wheat crop, ultra-conservative. Yes, indeed. As would you. There is no social safety net. There is not a lot of things to fall back on. What's in their bank account? Trick question. Ah, uh, uh, livestock. I love the livestock answer. Yes, that is your walking bank account. Seed. Yeah, you said seed. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if anybody said fruit, but not so much. Kind of, you know, rots. Fruit trees. Yes, yes, very nice. Coffee breaks. Coffee breaks in their bank account? No, coffee bricks. Oh, poppy bricks. Yes, yeah. Oh, that's, that's an important one, yes. As well. Not so much money, things like that. So, the whole livestock one that we'll get to in a little bit later of why, you know, their walking bank account. It's one reason they may focus on having a lot of animals that they keep alive, even if the productivity of those animals is actually quite low. Say in the West, if you've got, you know, I was sitting on the plane, the guy next to me, he was a dairy farmer. Western Washington State. I said, oh, you have a lot of cows. He says, 1,250. He milks them three times a day and or his staff because he's trying to get every last ounce of milk out of those cows. They are a productive resource. They are not his bank account. I mean, he makes his living with 1,250 cows, but that's not his bank account, right? If you're an Afghan farmer and you've got 20 goats and 20 sheep, that is your bank account, and you're not trying to get the last amount of wool and the last amount of milk out of those animals, right? You don't slaughter those animals until it looks like, I think that one's about to die, quick, let's have it for dinner. <laughs> um, you know, there's not a lot of feed them as fast as you can, grate it at optimum weight, and then slaughter it. That's not how they treat their livestock. Money, we all like to make money, right? So tempting to make it perfect. Yes, if you're an Afghan farmer, if you're a Western farmer, yeah, we should make it perfect. But does that actually make sense? I said it before. Fix that easiest, that least resource-intensive thing first, right? Somebody gave me the example of, we should go up to Badakhshan. I hear there's a sick goat up here, and we could make this the goat, the most perfect goat in all of Afghanistan. Not so much. Forget about the one goat in Badakhshan. Try to figure out how you can help 10,000 farmers. If you can get 10,000 farmers to plant their corn in a row and their yield only goes up 5%, you just help 10,000 farmers increase their yield by 5%. That is a huge change, and it costs you virtually nothing. Keep those kinds of ideas in your mind. Oh, and uh, be patient, because they, they, the Afghans, are definitely not on your timeline. You may be looking at your rip and you're like, I have nine more months to go. And I know the problem is we all, whether military or civilian, we all want to get the pat on our back for the time that we were in the country. We get our star for doing the right thing. Fair enough. But also remember, try to use those successors that you have down the line, whatever mechanism that may be, whether it's the farmer because you've taught him something new, whether it's the Afghan government because they changed the policy or because you've got civilians that you're working with. Somehow figure out what that is. Geography matters, that first picture. See, it looks exciting. I am not a big fan myself. I'm one of those civilians. I try to run away from things like that. That is not me. If you're an Afghan farmer, this is, impacts you quite a bit. Insecurity is the number one problem that Afghan farmers have, depending on where they are in the country. 
those roads, for those of you who have been there before, A, a white Corolla, they're all white Corollas, and B, yes, the re roads really do look that way. If you're a farmer, no wonder they toss their products just in the back of the trunk because that's what they have, and no wonder they get squashed because that's what the roads look like. You know, that's not a, I had to spend four years here to get that picture, right? That picture happens every day, somewhere. Irrigation, access to roads, electricity, VFUs are veterinary field units because they do like their animals, right? And proper medication and vaccinations do help quite a bit. Price information, not having to rely on one middleman who comes to your village, but actually knowing what the products, the, the price of products is in some ultimate market. And they have this now because 10 years ago there were no cell, phone, cell phones and now virtually every Afghan has access one way or the other to a cell phone. Tribes, insecurity, access to markets, these are all problems, right? Geography, depending on where you are, Helmand, Kandahar versus, say, you know, Badakhshan, those variables will all change and be important. Oh, all the things you shouldn't do. So a friend of mine spent about, I don't know, as a civilian, three years, I think, with the military, I think mostly in Ghazni or so, or maybe Wardak as well. He was asked to give a presentation <clears throat> and the commander said, I think it's important for them to know stuff like this. So this is what it is. Pure copy and paste on my side, but take a look at the list. Don't do integration work that the community can do itself. Great minds think alike, right? I mentioned it earlier, and sure enough, this comes up. Let me skip that second one for a moment. Don't get between two traders and their money. Yes, yes. Don't give them seeds. You know, buying certified, that might be another man. Don't do cash for work. Giving them something, I guess, is the real kind of bugaboo here. Um, I've had some presentations where they said, well, we're going to do a training, and you know, we're hoping to get all the farmers in the community to get together. By the way, we're going to be handing them out wheelbarrows and axes you know, as a little thank you giveaway. <clears throat> if it takes a giveaway for them to come to your training, something is wrong with your training. The really successful trainings are the farmers are going, hey, when are you going to have that training again? Hey, I heard in the next village over you gave a training on X. That's why you want them to come to your training. You don't need inducements. Not necessary. Serving tea, that's just polite. Providing them with axes and wheelbarrows, questionable. That second one, <clears throat> so I'm a civilian. This applies to me. I'll tell you a little anecdote. This is out of Kandahar. Uh, we were uh, working in a whole variety of districts, some of them not so safe, and, but the communities really valued what we were doing. We had gained their trust, we had spent some years there. The way we worked is we would work in one community and would say, hey, can you introduce us to the next one? And they say, sure. So we had an automatic kind of in with the next community. And the deal was always the same. Something bad happens, we leave and we don't come back because our security depends on you. We do not have swivel guns on MRAPs. And the elders of the community would say, absolutely, we understand the deal. And so we'd get phone calls. Mm, today's not a good day to come. Come next week. Okay, we got the message and we'd stay away. <coughs> Eventually something bad happened and a couple of our drivers got snatched. Thankfully, we got them back, but we pulled out of that district. And eventually, they, the kind of the second string players from the district showed up at our compound and said, look, we're really sorry. It wasn't our fault. We didn't know. And two things then happened. We said, A, no, we're not coming back because something bad happened, and you should have prevented it. You should have told us not to come that day. And B, not the most senior elders from the community that had come to apologize, right? They'd sec sent their second string players, as it were. We don't actually know if they were telling the truth or not. Maybe there really was an unexpected event, right? The point was this. Every other district in Kandahar was watching us because they knew who we were. And if we broke down and went back to that district, forget it. You know, our deal was no longer valid. So we stuck to our guns. Figuratively speaking, we did not go back to that district. And all the other districts and communities are like, you know those guys who are really helpful with X, Y, and Z? You got to help them out because otherwise they're not bringing their know-how. They're not bringing their insight and we're not going to earn extra money. 
Now, a lot of times, I say, does the military have this choice? Maybe a lot of times you don't. Uh, we had somebody in the, one of, in the previous class that says, no, no, we use the same principle, right? You can rely on the fact that it, does, it can be a deal, right? You can provide services in places where they put skin in the game. They protect you. Um, I certainly don't know what your exact situation is going to work out, but maybe understand that from a civilian perspective, <coughs> sometimes that's how we operate. Any other questions? Um, farm demos. So we're ag development people. We love farm demonstrations. I'm guessing maybe you guys aren't going to be doing farm demonstrations. Maybe, <coughs> excuse me, you'll be involved with one. Um, anybody from a farm background? Nobody, nobody. Well, just a hint. Um, even in 12 months there, you can't train a perfectly excellent farmer, right? It takes a long time. Doesn't really what the, you know, what it is, where, depending on where you are in the country, doesn't matter what the crop is that you're growing, right? Some of the important things that always come up, A, soil fertility, which is universal in the country almost, and number two, irrigation, which is incredibly important, and I don't know, 80, 90% of the country, right? Very high up on the list. These are things that you should always be paying attention to. Um, otherwise, you know, things that work on farm demonstration, whether it's seed or it's irrigation or it's pruning. There's lots and lots of examples, and it really depends on the value chains that you're engaged with. No time for ag. Let's say you're civil affairs officer. I don't know. You guys are civil affairs officers? Anybody? Yeah. Nod. Heads are nodding. Very good. End states versus process, right? That whole thing about teaching a man to fish. This comes from that same list, something... Doing something doesn't count if people in the government aren't there to support it. You may think it's a good idea. Unless the farmers have really said, no, I want to do this. I'll put skin in the game. That's what really counts. In terms of your resources, how are you going to try and get to your end states? I have there, call a man in green, right? I know they're quickly phasing out, but there are still some ADTs, agribusiness development teams in the country. So maybe for your chain of command, that's the easiest thing in terms of you have a question to try and get an answer. Otherwise, there's all kinds of civilians running around. Ask them. Sometimes AID projects, they run a lot longer than maybe a typical deployment, right? Four and five years. The contractors, the implementers that are there, they may have a number of years' experience on the ground. They may be able to give you some good insight. There's different government agencies, whether it's the USDA or people like me, AID, NGOs, implementing partners. Keep those resources in mind. Try to coordinate, otherwise you end up with a game of Buskashi. And I don't know if you've ever seen, of, seen a game of Buskashi, but <coughs> apparently there's two teams. That's in theory only. As far as I could tell when I was watching a game of Buskashi, it's everybody against everybody else. You see the big felt hats they have? It wasn't cold. They got whips, and they're not for the horses. <laughs> anyway, it's an incredibly fun game to watch. Try to coordinate as much as you can. Find out what's going on in your area. Dale, mail, the private sector, all these good things that we should be doing. Building capacity, providing services, sustainability. Big word, right? Um, mm, a whole list at the end, these kind of choices that sometimes you may be asked to make. Vaccinating animals or building the capacity of veterinary field units, right? Build the capacity of the field unit. Building irrigation infrastructure or teaching better on-farm water management practices. Another example from Helmand. Uh, you may remember several years ago, big marines went into Marja, uh, a district of types in, in Helmand. Marja is a huge irrigation area. On average, very successful. The ones that are really successful are the ones halfway down the irrigation canal. Because the ones at the top of the irrigation the canal, the ones who can, if they want to, take, quote, all the water and overwater their fields, that's by and large what they do because their irrigation practices are lousy. Water's so valuable, they're like, oh, I'm at the top of the canal. I should take it. Bad irrigation practice. Providing high quality seed or supporting the development of certified seed producers. Well, of course, we want certified seed producers, right? Building a market center and storage facility or facilitating market information systems. 
At one point, everybody was like, we should build a bazaar, right? Trust me, Afghans don't need us to build them a bazaar. They can show up with their carts and their car Corollas just as well as without us, right? They don't need fancy infrastructure to do their trading. What they do need is price information, thanks to mobile phones that, by and large, is changing. They need to know what their products are worth. When can they sell them for what price? Things like that are really important. Sure as KLEs, I didn't used to know the acronym KLE, right? We all love key leader engagements. Other Christmas lists, those guys up there, they do not speak English, and they understand every word that you're saying. They have seen you for the last 10 years. They're going to play you like a fiddle, potentially. Either that, or they really care about their, their community, and they're going to make sure that their community comes first, right? Figure out what their community is. Are they engaged in trying to you know, help their family and their tribe, or are they really there to help their community as best they can? They may have a long, long list. Try to figure out what's the most important for the community, the area that you're in, not necessarily for those guys, who may actually be there to represent the community, but figure that out. Understand their perspective. Food security, bad irrigation. I keep mentioning irrigation like it's important. Uh, limited market access. Where's my market access? Where am I going to sell my stuff? Sick plants and animals, right? Always, always. Figure out how to help those 10,000 out the 10, right? Try to do the small thing, the simple thing, the cheap thing for a lot, a lot of people. Who are these crazy, crazy people? <coughs> Frighteningly enough, these are friends of mine. But you do have access to other people. USAID, we used to have a lot of FPOs, field program officers. And with transition, those are largely going away. But you still, do still have access to AID. Several AID people in the country. If you have a question that you think is development related, find somebody. If you're on CAF and you're on Bagram, I can promise you you'll, there'll be AID people there. Contractors, implementers of various kinds. Those other crazy acronyms there, those are just names of USAID projects, right? You may run across a lot. Find out what those acronyms mean, what that project is. Say, oh, I'm in Provis X, and there's a project called RADAP. RADAP means nothing to me. To me stands for Regional Agricultural Development Program. It's one of the new projects that's uh, starting later this year. The implementers there, their job is to have a four or five year timeline perspective and know everything that's going on ag related. And you can ask them for information. AID timelines, you know, we're not going anywhere, right? Five years, 10 years, 20 years, who knows how long we'll be in Afghanistan. But that's an institutional resource that you can draw on. Um, this is the same list from where I talked about my, my colleague who had made the presentation. Look at those lists. <clears throat> now, I don't know why you guys would be engaged with an activity that might uh, uh, give the Taliban traction in your AO, but apparently that was important for the presentation. Does this activity increase support for Jeroa? When I say activity, something that you're directly initiating, something that you may be engaged with, something you're being asked to pass judgment on, recommend to your commander, whatever it may be. Does it help the Afghan government, or maybe does it go against the Afghan government? Which could possibly be? Ask yourself that question. Has the community prioritized this activity? That's important. I th I'm not sure if it's on, maybe it's on the next slide. Have you coordinated or contacted a civilian? I'll give you another little anecdote. Uh, let me see. Uh, was, uh, was Roots of Peace here at the beginning of the week? Did Gary tell you the story about his um, uh, saplings and things like that? Well, he compared them to the, the uh, distribution. The uh, their efforts compared to, I think, the giveaway. Right, exactly. So I don't know if you guys remember this story, right? We've got all these different institutions, and everybody's got their mission, right? And sometimes those missions coordinate, and sometimes they conflict. And this was a story where the military had been tasked to distribute free of charge fruit, seed, uh, fruit saplings for an orchard. So if you're a farmer, hey, you're like, hey, completely free saplings, sure, I'll do that. Well, that ran head on into a program that AID was doing that we were like, we will subsidize this, but you still got to put in 50% of the effort. <clears throat> and we will also provide you training to go along with the distribution of these saplings. And of course, the end result was that the saplings that are given away for free, quote, with no training, 
a lot of those die off. The ones where the farmer skin in the game because they've paid for half of them and they're getting training, the value of those, the chance is that those saplings are going to survive. That happens to be an example where the do a D effort resulted in a worse. I don't mean to say that it's always like that at all, right? It's just an example of where different missions can collide. Figure out what those are. Try to coordinate. Will the community contribute land, labor, security, and all of that kind of stuff? Make sure they put skin in the game. Your success will increase dramatically if that is the case. And if you're just thinking, I think this is a great idea, and you start and do it, or you recommend that it be done, or whatever your, your uh, contribution may be. See if you can get this. Oh my gosh. More of the same base, he laid. Not that I want to end on this kind of note, but you wanting a project more than the Afghans wanting it. Mm, doesn't work, right? Assuming Afghans will, quote, take it over. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Buy-in versus acknowledgement, right? This is... You, s you hear that, you're like, hey, we need to have the Afghans involved. So you have a two-week you know, planning process, and on day 14, you bring the Afghan in. The head sure, and you're like, I got the most important guy here. You explain to him what you want to do, and he goes, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. He's just acknowledged what you're doing. If you bring him in on day one and get the whole community there, the whole shura, and they you know, make your life more difficult by wanting to influence how it's done and what it's done, that will have a bigger chance of success. Being a believer, if you, build, if you build it, give them something, do good things, and good things will happen. Well, of course, no. <coughs> uh, other funders in the AO, I think we touched on that just now, what they may be doing. Anyway, that is the uh, presentation. The question is, what do you actually remember after an hour plus of death by PowerPoint? You remember nothing at all. Skin in the game. Thank you very much. Irrigation. Irrigation. Thank you. That table. I'm sorry? Soil fertility. That's another good one. Okay. Because I, when are you guys going? Next week? Next month? October. October. Okay. Some earlier than that. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. What do you remember over here? Anything? Oh, fabulous. Outstanding. A plus all the way around. Get them to provide for themselves. Another good one. Yes. Just read the list. <laughs> this list. You're going to forget this list. That one doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot. Chris, we have a couple of minutes. Um, I, I know at the beginning of the week, some of you uh, were, were very interested in exploring a little bit about the poppy. I, had, I was out of the room for a few minutes. Did you get a chance to... What do you want to know about Poppy? Because Chris is, uh, you know, you can take it uh, definitely from the AID perspective. He can probably give you an update on where, where AID's, uh, AID's position is with the... Uh, Afghanistan grows a lot of Poppy. <laughs> the flowers are really pretty. Um, what else do you want to know? Yeah. There's no program to take advantage of the Poppy. It's always the right occasion or... What to put in Alternatives, that's the word, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, any, any advice or any, anything that has been looked into, see if, if they can actually get whatever change already uh, that the, the poppy is going to do. Um, catch it in the middle um, and provide it to the outside, uh, to put it, to all their um, network, like church. Yes, for use it like Turkey and Australia are using it for for medicine. Right. There 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 Right. Things. There there are legal producers in the world for morphines and all the derivatives that you know you may may get. Um, what you need for that, for example, Tasmania is one of the biggest producer of legal heroin that gets turned into morphine and things like that. Uh, is you need rule of law. You need very tight control which is exactly what does not exist in Afghanistan. So India is a huge producer of that. And the farmers, they get to grow only very small plots. All of the plants are actually counted. The government official comes by, predicts exactly how much they're going to produce, comes by at harvest season, collects exactly that amount, right? There's no leakage, right? They're not diverting part of it. Afghanistan is the opposite end of the spectrum, you know? 
law enforcement, the rule of law is very, very weak, which means leakage would be almost total, which is why I legal production wouldn't work in Afghanistan. Though there was an NGO about nine, ten years ago that was recommending exactly that. So, not a crazy idea, just one that probably won't work in Afghanistan. Very good question. Have there been more examples of successful poppy eradication or a whole catalogue of disasters where perhaps we shouldn't have eradicated the poppies in the first place? There, um, the, um, there is, um, the U.S., technically does not do any eradication themselves. There is a funding program through the State Department, INL. Uh, Governor-led eradication, and I think this past year they, I don't know, eradicated somewhere maybe 6,000 hectares, something like that, don't quote me on the number. Uh, the Afghan Ministry of Counter-Narcotics um, believes in eradication, not in terms of getting rid of all the poppy, but introducing risk into the process. So. <coughs> Growing poppy, just from a mathematical standpoint, is in terms of you know, your inputs and in terms of how much money you get out, you'll see these numbers like you can get $10,000 per hectare, you know, those most valuable crop there is in the country. But it's actually quite high risk for the farmer because they may have to contend with law enforcement, they may have to contend with, the er with eradication. So it's, it's one of the reasons that farmers do not grow poppy, some farmers is that there's always this risk that they might get eradicated. So it exists in principle, even though it's never intended to wipe out 100% of the crop. I think that the Russians would probably prefer we wipe out 100% of the crop, but uh, that's not happening. Uh, on a separate subject, I'm just curious, uh, as, uh, as we do transition, what, what are you currently hearing from AID's perspective on um, AID is certainly not going away. We're just starting projects now that have five-year timelines. So at a very minimum, you know, we're there until 2017, 2018. And I'm sure actually far beyond that is the international donor community itself is not going away. Um, I think how we behave and where we have staff is changing dramatically. So for example, in, in southern Afghanistan, we used to, I don't know what the numbers, had a hundred staff, you know, all around in DSTs and FOBs and, you know, you name it, all these outlying areas. And all of those have been pulled back now because, by and large, those military installations have gone away as well, right? And they're all sitting on CAF now in Kandahar. Um, but what we're, what we're doing and how we're going to do it through implementers is still the same. You know, what changes for us is more on a... Uh, a lower level. How we do our monitoring and evaluation becomes more difficult because we can't actually send government employees out. We have to rely now on yet other implementers to do our checking, our verification, our supervision. I guess I'm curious, uh, as it changes from, uh, I guess, <coughs> uh, from a combat zone to more of a, a country, a, a complex and secure country, uh, will, it, will it take the role of looking more like a third world country where we're normally in, or does it still act like a combat zone with right. I, I, I haven't got that memo yet. I don't know, man. I'm, I I'm just curious your feeling. You know, uh, it, it, you know it, is a, it is anybody's guess what actually is you know, going to happen in a year from now or two years from now and three. And I, and I wish I knew, right? In, in some sense, right, you know, when half the guns leave, you know, there's, there's fewer things to shoot at, so maybe it becomes more secure. On the other hand, maybe the Taliban, I don't know, you know, this way outside my... Uh, I hope it gets better, of course. You know, it's a fabulous country. It's a fascinating country. Um, and they, they deserve some peace and quiet and, you know, have their economy grow, which they desperately need. And agriculture does. It is the most important subject. Sure. Thank you. I, uh, you, you, have, you, you have an idea? Yes. Uh, so I'm going to contact you to contact you to and help my thoughts to create something that this is a scenario. For at a village or district level, how we can actually implement not eradication, not saying that something for the farmer to start pushing, harvesting less poppy and pushing more other crop. How you implement that? Right. There, there are. So, the difference between an ag project and an alternative, what we call an alternative development project, simply is it's still agriculture at the end of the day, right? <coughs> they do not grow 
uh, Poppy and Helmut and Kandahar because they have no other choices, right? It is, it is, it is not, these are not the poorest places, the worst agricultural places, far from it, right? They actually do very well. The reason they grow so much poppy in Helmand and Kandahar is because this is where you have the greatest insecurity, the greatest lack of governance, right? That's why Helmand for especially grows so much. They have all kinds of alternatives with pomegranates, with raisins, with almonds, with melons. I mean, you know, on that first list, you know, when I showed you those three different provinces as an example, this is one of the great places in the country, Helmand and Kandahar. They've got good irrigation schemes, uh, good soil. There's all kinds of options. Um, and it's convincing, you know, changing the political dynamic and the security environment and the governance environment in those places so farmers will move towards the alternatives that already exist there. What AID does is provide ever more trading on how to make that even more successful. You know, if the ratio of income, instead of being you know, three to one, only becomes two to one, you'll have ever more farmers move in the direction of, of utilizing those alternatives. Remember, as we mentioned, and, and Gary had a slide comparing opium to pomegranates and almonds. Again, there's land rights issues. A lot of the farmers uh, do not own the land that they right. farm. So there's serfdom. I mean, it's a yeah. tenant farmer kind of environment. So the farmer on the land may not be making the decision as to what actually gets grown there. So the, for, for the <coughs> farmer that, it, that is growing the poppy, it would probably have to be a seasonal crop, a high-value seasonal crop, like you mentioned, a, a high-value yeah. melon or perhaps the spices or herbs or, or yeah. something that may, within one season, uh, be somewhat competitive. Plus, you know, I mean, for example, development community in general, we always, for that reason, we prefer perennials, right? Because if you've got a pomegranate tree, you're not going to rip it out and plant poppy for one year, right? Other, if you just have annuals, you can switch back and forth and say, I'll grow poppy this year and something else the following year, et cetera, et cetera. But if you've got orchards and vineyards and the whole nine yards, you're stuck and stuck in a good way because A, it's a high value crop and B, you don't, you don't need to worry about that farmer saying, oh, I'm going to rip out my vineyard and, and put in poppy. That's not how it works. The only thing they might do is take their wheat fields annual and say, you know, I can now, because I'm making more money, because I've got certified seed and I don't need to grow as much, I'll take part of my wheat field and actually turn it into another vineyard. That's what we hope and that's what we're doing. Anything else? Cool. Thanks a lot.